All right. So, um, a lot of times, a lot of times, Bible, pretty much, a lot, almost all the time, Bible studies will really touch our hearts. You know, it'll it'll uh, speak to our lives and and things that are going on. And then other times, it will speak right to your face. And tonight is going to be one of those nights, I can assure you, because no one gets out alive tonight. In a good way, not a bad way. It's just that we've all been through this, and you're probably experiencing it right now, and you're just not sure what to do about it. Let's open up some prayer. Father, we thank you tonight for your word, Lord, and, and just the way Paul breaks all this stuff down, Father, and all the great life lessons from 2,000 years ago that we can still apply to our lives today, Father, and tonight is no exception. So we do invite your Holy Spirit to be with us, to open our eyes and ears and our hearts to the message you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen? All right. So check this out. Last week, Paul was uh, sharing with us the struggles of, of church um, legalism in the church. Has anybody ever been exposed to legalism in church? I, I know that in, the, uh, in, in Judaism, there's, there's a lot of laws. There's so many laws and dietary laws and where you can go and what you can't do. You know, just lots of things that you got to kind of be wary of. But by and large, um, unless, you know, you have sin sniffers. Anybody ever deal with sin sniffers, by the way? You know, the ones just go around looking, following people to see if they can catch them doing something wrong. So that's what the Judaizers were doing that we've been talking about all this time. They were following Paul around and Barnabas, and they were trying to pick little things that they could then use against him in some legalistic way. And, you know, Paul just kept blowing them off. And everybody came together in, in the churches. It was really a beautiful thing until today. I know, right? So here's the opening. If someone you love were doing something wrong, how would you confront that person? Anybody ever had to confront someone that they care about? Sucks, huh? But there's big blessings on the other side. And we're going to take a look at that tonight as we move through this thing. So check this out. We're going to be picking the, the story up in chapter 2, uh, verse 11. So remember, this all happened when this was written, about 54, 55 A.D. All this stuff that Paul's telling the Galatians, the Galatians about happened 14 years prior to this. So this is all kind of a history lesson. So things had changed a little bit since then, but he was he was trying to show them something very important, just like he was the Corinthians, how you can learn from other people's mistakes. If you're a wise apple, that is. Amen? So what we're going to read right now had actually happened many years back. So what we had last week was Paul going to Jerusalem, by, by revelation. Remember, remember that word, apocalypsis. He was, he was, there was a rev, he was. It was revealed by Jesus for him to go to Jerusalem and deal with the whole issue of circumcision of the Gentiles up in Antioch. So up in Antioch means they were up. Uh, Anti or Galatia was a, a Roman province, like like all of Turkey was a Roman province called Galatia, and quite a few churches came out of that area, including. Um, um, what, what the heck was that church? Uh, there was a really good one. It was in Revelation. I can't remember what it is right now, but he was talking to them. So now Peter had gone up to Antioch, this church. Now Peter was the uh, like the big cheese. He was the top dog there in the southern church, Jerusalem, which was way more, um, uh, they, they adhered more to the law in Jerusalem. And so when they when they encountered the, the Gentiles, they, they were grateful and all that but they wanted them to start being uh, more jewish because they weren't jewish uh, a gentile is anything except for a jew all of us are gentiles unless somebody's jewish in here i don't know and so they they kind of viewed them as heathens you know they they viewed them as a lot of people probably view us as a matter of fact huh bikers <laughs> that was such a fun time at that synagogue who went to the who went to a congregation uh, Emmanuel? Was that not cool, man? They sang songs to us. For those of you who don't know, on Rolling Glory One, that was a big surprise. We went to this uh, Emmanuel up there, and Cantor Jen had it all set up, man, and everybody was outside, and she 
She gave a great speech anyway. She's quite an orator. And then she sang a song, which was really cool, uh, Traveler's Blessing. But then the little kids all sang us a song. These little, they're like, you know, five, six years old. And what, what were they singing? Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Yeah, man, it was so cool. People were all bawling their eyes out and stuff like that. And it really was a spectacular kickoff to Rolling Glory 4. And now all the flags are in the possession of the Arizona Liaison, Bruce and Suzanne, and they're already set up to go to Gallup, New Mexico. But I've been getting bombed from states all over, all the way up in the north, all over the place. People that want to carry those flags, man. I told them, I said to the, to the Israel, to the Jews, I said, look, you might feel alone and scared and hated, but that doesn't represent us. <clears throat> we as a nation of Americans stand by Israel. The little teeny little group of people that are being a bunch of knuckleheads over there, they don't represent us, even though that's all the news will show. So they're going to, they're, they're getting all this stuff on Facebook, you know, on the Rolling Glory 4, and they're seeing all the love that's being poured over there. I'm getting... I'm getting calls. From, I've been heard from Israel, not from Israel, but through Scott Sober. People are, are watching the Facebook page in Israel, man, in Jerusalem, and it's given them all kinds of hope and joy, man. And eventually those flags will land in Jerusalem. Amen. Just such a good thing, man. God's so good, isn't he? And we got to be part of it. So now that, that uh, Paul had come, you know, gone back up to Antioch and and that whole Jerusalem council was over. Peter now went up there. So Peter's been up in Antioch, in the Antioch church, hanging out with the Gentiles, having a great time, by the way. You know, they, they're not as strict and tight as the, the Jews are down in, in Jerusalem. And, and not only that, but they're Gentiles for one thing. But turns out they had some Jews up there as well. So it's not as strict with, like, the dietary laws and and. I don't, you know, I only go as far as say like the Sabbath, the Sabbath laws, stuff like that. I'm sure Peter followed that. But, you know, there, there's a lot of laws, man, that were written after the Big Ten, you know. They just kind of kept coming. And so Peter, this big, loud fisherman. You want to you know what Peter looked like? Y anybody in here? Where's Pat? Could you stand up for a second, Pat? With a little more on him, that would be Peter right there. Happy, loud, you know, animated guy. So he's up there in Antioch having a good old time, man. He's probably putting down hot dogs and all kinds of cool stuff like that. And, it, you know, th they wouldn't be putting down in Jerusalem because there's some serious dietary laws, right? The whole kosher thing and all that. So Peter's having a great time. They're loving him. He's loving the Gentiles. The whole church thing's going. And this is where we pick up the story. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was... He was to be blamed, for before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. What a drag, man. Now, I know you, you guys have probably never done this or been, have been encountered this sort of thing, but what was happening here now, it was like if someone real famous from some religious organization you know, came and hung with, oh, you know what, I'll use Scott Sober. Hey, Scott, here, you're going to watch this, all right? So Scott comes from Bridges for Peace, and, and for those of you that met Scott, he's a really cool dude, right? I mean, he's even trying to grow a beard and everything and, like, you know, blend a little bit in here. So he doesn't look so much like a cop or a golfer. <laughs> and he hung out with us. We had a really good time. We laughed. We eat together. We had a good time. And then all of a sudden, some of the bigwigs from Bridges for Peace maybe from Jerusalem or Florida, the headquarters, showed up, and all of a sudden, Scott's just like cold as ice to us, and he kind of goes and just hangs with those guys back there, you know, with the arms folded. Now, Bridges doesn't do that. I'm just using his own. Their arms folded, looking around here, going, <laughs> motorcycles hanging from the ceiling. Oy vey. There's a shotgun hanging above that sound booth right there. And they call this a house of God. And Scott's like, I know, man. You know, I've been, I've been trying to counsel them. <laughs> they're just a stubborn group they're just heathens and there's a word in here that you're going to see how would that make you feel for those of you that have met Scott wouldn't it be a drag okay well Paul witnessed it and he wasn't having it and when it says here I withstood him to his face he's saying I stopped him right there as soon as he walked through the door right to his face and it was probably you know Paul with his hands on his, his hips looking up 
Hey, you. And look what happened here. He said that it was because, because he was blamed. He was guilty. He'd done something. And, and he was caught at it. And he didn't even realize. And that's a really important lesson for all of us here tonight. That you, you all might think you're getting away with stuff. But I'm here to tell you right now, man. It's hard to hide stuff anymore. It's really hard to hide stuff anyway from God and what he wants to expose. But in our day and age now, there's something we have to all remember. It's technology. There's phones, there's travel, there's all sorts of stuff. And as we go through this, I'm going to show you how easy it is to uh, get caught up in some ugly stuff. But anyway, he said he was doing all this before certain men came from James. These are the guys from Jerusalem. Some of the leaders in the Jerusalem church had come up, the James gang, man. And, you know, he was probably over there in the corner. Ha, 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 ha. And these guys walk in the room, man, and he just shut it down, man. And whoever he was sitting with, he just got up and split and went over there. Well, Paul saw this, and he felt that it needed to be addressed right now, which, in fact, it did get addressed at this time 14 years before. And things vastly changed for Peter. As you go through the book of Acts, you see where Peter was ministering to the Jews. That was kind of his thing. Paul was ministering to Gentiles. Peter was ministering to the Jews. James was kind of running the church there in Jerusalem. And as you go through Acts, you start seeing Peter not only spending more time with Gentiles and seeking them out, but also defending them as well. So sometimes what, what seems like a really a real drag and very humiliating or whatever, God will, will bless that depending on how you receive it. And this is an important part as we go through here tonight. He would eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he would draw and separate himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. Now, this is a real fun word right here, because the word fearing in, in the Greek is phobia. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Phobia? What word do you think we get from that in the English? Phobia. That's right. So now when we look at this, what, what was the phobia that was going on in that Jewish church there at that point? I mean, they were welcoming them. They were happy for them. But at the same time, there was some phobia about the Gentiles. But we're past that, right? Jesus died on the cross. We've been forgiven of all our sins. He, he put, it's not that he ended the law, but he... He became all the law and the forgiveness and the promise. So when, when we became a Christian church, not, not a Jewish synagogue, it's not that the laws were bad. They were good. You know, I, I agree with, with some of the, the dietary stuff. Like if I'm eating like pork and it's bleeding, I ain't going to eat it, man. Or chicken that's still got blood in it. When you take a big bite, and it's like running out and stuff like that. I'm all for that whole thing. I will eat. I will not eat that chicken, as a matter of fact. Steak, on the other hand, I don't even care if it hits the grill, man. But that's not in there, okay? So he had a phobia. There was a phobia going on. And, you know, I look at the stuff that's going on today, in particularly with Jews and, and people that hate Jews. And, and you can ask them, why do you hate the Jews? And they won't have an answer. They like, just say, give me, give me one thing that they did in history that made them such a hated nation. And there's nothing that they've did. They've never committed genocide as much as they try to say that they have. They've been persecuted from way back before World War II. And then, and then as prophecy was fulfilled, there they are in Jerusalem in the 40s, yet they're still hated. And then we have these people and the, at the uh, colleges with a phobia. And then when I look at this word, I'm like, it's a fear that they have. They don't know why they hate them and why they're so aggressive towards them. It's a phobia. They fear them. Why do they fear them? I believe it's the Spirit of God upon them. Amen? And the same thing happens with Christians as well. When Christians have no reason to, to hate, hate you, or people have no reason to hate Christians, it's a phobia, and, it, and it's, a, it's an internal thing on them, that there's something that they're fearful of. More than likely, I would have to say it's the fear of change, that they would actually have to no longer run their own jacked-up program but hand their life over to the God of all creation and live under an umbrella of righteousness. And that sucks, doesn't it, to live under an umbrella of righteousness and turn our lives over to Christ, right? I mean, is that like the worst thing we've done in our whole lives? 
it's our lives have radically changed we're we're happy yeah we still have stuff going on don't we there's things that happen but don't you feel more secure just as a human being knowing that you are a child of god man and there's a future for you it, it's there's blessings between here and being called home or the rapture but we know for a fact that we will one day spend eternity with him in heaven right Okay, so these people that are pushing back on that, my, my thing was, is why were the Jews doing it, though? And I, I can understand because there's programming, man, just like what's going on in the colleges right now. There's programming and programming and programming, like a, I don't want to go as far as a brainwashing, but the stuff they're being taught by professors who, I have no idea what their deal is, not a pickle, not yet. But people are being brought into these colleges and paid to teach these kids how to riot and break into places and get away from cops and deal with tear gas and stuff like that. It, it's, just, it's just so bizarre to me that I'm reading it right here, yet it's happening right now in our country. So, so that was Peter's problem. He, he wasn't, in, and just so you know, I don't think that Peter had a phobia with the Gentiles because he was having too much fun with them. He was having a good time. What his fear was, and it says right here, he would do and separate himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision, the guys that were coming that had the phobias. So this tells me that when they're not in Antioch, hanging out, being all buddy-buddy, eating food with them, stuff like that, when they're back in Jerusalem, what are they doing? Talking smack about them. Thank God that never happens around the roadhouse, right? where people talk smack about each other and stuff like that, but when they're in their face, they're all hugging, oh, I love you, brother, patting each other on the back, looking for a soft spot to stick that knife. <laughs> and the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrites with them so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Do you see how infectious this stuff can be, man? The Jews that were in Antioch, they were part of that church with the Gentiles. They were all brothers and sisters. They were tight, just like we are. It was a brotherhood, man. And Barnabas is the son of encouragement, man. He's the one that, that lifts people up and directs them and helps them move forward. But when all that was going on and, like, that side of the room started being all legalistic and, you know, start pointing out, you know, things about people. Start, you start looking around the room, you know, and, like, like those two guys over there, you know, they're always sitting with their arms crossed. You know, that that's what Christians do, you know. They're always up to something. And that one over there, right? We don't even need to know anything about him. Just look at him. That's all we need to know. And then walk over there to him. Hey, brother, how are you? Good to see you, man. It, isn't it, like, slimy? And it happens still to this day. And it may be happening to you, or you may be happening it out there. And if you are, knock it off, man. It's not cool. There's nothing, there's nothing cool about it. In fact, the people that you're talking to are taking notes on your attitude is just as much as you're taking notes back on theirs. And don't be fooled if you think the second you fall out of their little click that you ain't going to be on the other side of that thing. And then you're going to be the one that feels ostracized and left out and unloved. Look, man, give it to Christ already. Leave that nonsense behind. We, we are one big family because we are family. Look at you guys go. Now, he says here, but when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, he's getting ready to drop this thing. I, I got a few words for you because I want you to understand this stuff because it, it applies so much to our time right now. So that word straightforward there, when he's talking about that, it, the, the Greek word is this, orthopedia. Orthopedio. Orthopedio. What do we get out of that? Your feet, too. Your, you know, orthopedics, right? Your, your ability to walk straight. Ultimately, the, the, in, the, in the definition in Strong's, it, it's, it's referring to walking uh, the ability to continue to walk in a straight line, to maintain a straight line, the way you walk, your footing. And so he's going, look, when I saw, when I saw that they were leaning like a palm tree in a hurricane, leaning on their own ideas and things that they should, they weren't, they weren't 
orthopedia. They weren't walking correctly, man. And he goes, about the truth of the gospel. What does he mean by that? They're not walking in the truth. They're preaching the truth. And when they're, when they're together, when everybody's like looking in the room, when they're not by themselves, they're, my brother, how are you? Jesus loves you, man. He died, blah, 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 blah. And they run down the whole thing that Peter had laid down to them as an apostle. And, and yet, as soon as they take off, they're walking all crooked and all this other stuff, spiritually speaking, and going out there, go, this is a bunch of lamos, man. That's like trying to teach a bunch of rhinoceroses the word of God, man. What are we even doing here? Why bother? The... Well, Paul was watching, and others were watching. And that's what brings us back to the watching thing. You never know who's watching you. And not necessarily like, whoa, you know, binoculars or something like that. You just be uh, very innocent, in fact, on, on somebody's part that, you know, may go out to dinner somewhere. For instance, I'll give you a hypothetical. Someone goes out to dinner somewhere, they're going to, you know, have dinner, and they walk in and they see so-and-so with so-and-so at a table, you know, a few, uh, you know, empty cocktail glasses there, and they're sharing a little bowl of spaghetti, doing that little spaghetti thing, you know. It's adorable. It's adorable until they come back not knowing anything wrong about it and start sharing oh you should have seen this and that over there they, they clearly were having a good time with their cocktails and their spaghetti straw well that word gets back to Paul where'd Paul go is he still here Paul Burdett who does the busted knuckles next door and it turns out that this of the that he's been working with for three three or four months now to help him battle his alcoholism and, and the brother had been telling him how good he's doing, and Paul's spending all time and, and effort in there to help this person continue on, and is now just sitting somewhere getting drunk with somebody. And then as the, as the story continues to move around, it heats up a little bit, and it turns out that the this and that are married to different people. You see how quickly these things can come down on you. And, and listen, God will reveal. I'm here to tell you the truth, man. God will reveal, man, because he loves you. And he'll also empower very courageous, brave people to be willing to step up to your face and just lay it out right there. And they can go two ways, man. You can either cop to it or you can lie, right? Has anybody ever lied when they were confronted? Only a couple of you? Okay. How many of you are lying right now? After that, you can be humiliated and pissed off and angry and say, screw you. I don't want nothing to do with you ever again. Get out of my life. Go away, blah, blah, blah. Or you can follow the word of God and you can repent. You can confess. You can ask forgiveness. And then you put all that into what? Action. Don't just speak it, man. You turn it around and you go the other way. And when you do that, I mean genuinely from your heart, man, not just lip service or nothing like that. God is quick to restore, man, and tear the junk off and start throwing revelation after revelation. It, it's really super cool. So clearly, Peter, uh, I, haven't got to, I haven't got to chapter 3, so I'm not sure how that story totally turned out. But I'll tell you what, uh, we can find it in the book of Acts. Because after we're done with the epistles, I'm going to start in the book of Acts and do a whole verse by verse through there. So we can see all this stuff that we've been reading now. Anyway, so the problem at this point that we're having right now is that there is now a division, because that's what legalism does. It divides. It creates cliques. It, it creates people that like, okay, so, you know, I got all the answers, stuff like that. They're wrong about this. They're wrong about that. And you know what? If you want to you wanna hang out with me and ride with me, then come on over here, and I'll explain stuff to you. And then some of the people around are like, hey, you know what, man? I don't want to be on that side of this, man. I want to be on that side of it. I may not even agree with it, but you know what? I'm going to be in this team. I'm going to be in this little clique over here. That's legalism, and it's ugly, and it's destructive in the churches. And, and it happens all the time in America, probably all over the world, but, but in America, it happened here. We've had to deal with this stuff here through, all, through the years that we've had. We've had people through here every now and then that are just dead set certain to tell us just how wrong we're doing stuff. And, how, and the plan to make it happen and what they should do. And I'm like, well, cool, let me go over to your church and hang out for a little bit so I can get a, an idea. And they go, well, I don't have a church. Well, then shut up. <laughs> Until you do, you don't know the struggles that were going on, man. We're running on Jesus' power here. And let me take a look. Nope, you're not him. The Denver hater applications are right on the baptismal. Pick one up on your way out. Amen. And there's a few of them out there, you guys. I know, what a shock, right? There's Denver haters, show enough. 
So even Barnabas was carried away with her. And that's a very important sentence right there because Barnabas was an absolute um, connector. He was, a, he was an encourager. He was the one when Paul came and, and the apostles said, no, we don't want that dude around, man. He's killed like a whole bunch of Christians. He's, he's like the enemy right there and you're bringing him right over here to us. And, he's going, and Barnabas was going, no, man. He had an encounter with Jesus Christ, man. He's a new creation right now, and he's on fire for the Lord. Just listen to what he has to say. And it took a minute or two, but they all said, you know what? This man's been touched with, been, been with Jesus. Remember the apostles, uh, Peter, I can't remember which one, man. It was uh, Peter and somebody, man. And they were getting in trouble in one of the cities or something like that, and they wanted to they wanted to throw him, wanted him to shut up and quit preaching. But they continued to talk, and the, and the Pharisees all said, man, they recognized that these men had been with Jesus by the way they acted and the way they carried themselves and their courage, man, in the face of all the mobs and stuff like that. That's exactly how God would have it for us, that when we encounter people out there in the world, that they could feel in their own heart, man, this guy, this girl has been with Jesus, man. There's something special about them. And it's such a drag when we, when we mess that up, man, and we take that that little bit of holiness that God gives us to go out there and be a representation of Jesus Christ out there, and then we push it aside and go do stupid stuff with these people. Rather than leading them to the cross, we shrink back and allow our flesh to take over, man. It's a drag being human sometimes. But it's all a learning process, amen? Amen. How many, uh, just real quick before I go on so you can help me with the Bible study, how many of you actually do walk on water? Anybody? Because, no, I just want some help in here. I mean, if, if I got some water walkers in here. We all fall short of the glory of God, amen? But can't we try harder? I think we can. But check this out. Um, blah, 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 blah. So this is what he said. Um, Said to be, but when, when I saw they were all not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, right in front of everybody, if you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? So he's, he's calling them out right in front of the whole crowd, though. It, it's easier if you're by your, if it's one-on-one, but sometimes it happens that way because just before those guys came, from James, Peter was over there partying like a rock star, having a good time. I don't think he, I don't think he was doing anything wrong necessarily, like getting drunk or nothing like that. That's not what I mean. But he was in the pack. He was hanging out. He was having a good time, slapping on the back and eating some food and stuff like that. That's what he says here. He goes, if you being a Jew live in the manner of the Gentiles, that's what that means. He was eating the food that he probably shouldn't have been eating and stuff like that, whatever. And who knows what day it was. I would like to think it's not on a Sabbath, but who knows? There was something going on there. He says, you're living in the manner of the Gentiles and not as the Jews. So you're, you're, you're a Jew, but you're acting more like Gentile right now, you know. And, and that's cool. That's, that's not to say that that was the big problem right there. The big problem came this. Why do you compel the Gentiles to live as Jews then? If, if you're going to act like that, I mean, if you want them to live as Jews and follow the, the dietary regulations and the law, then you ought to live that law yourself. Amen. Why do we, what, why as Christians do we go out and hang out with sinners and stuff like that? Well, we want to go share the, the good news of sinners, right? Okay, but we're going out there partying with them and getting high and doing all kinds of stupid stuff, and I don't need to go down the list. Everybody in this room knows what it is, the things, all right? Why are we then, if we're going to continue, if we're going to act like heathens out there among them, why then are we going to turn around at some point and go, you need to knock it off? You need to straighten up your life. You need to walk in the light, man. You need to quit doing the sin and stuff like that. They're going to look at you and go, you hypocrite. And there we have it, the great argument of people that aren't saved. The church is full of? Hypocrites. Well, maybe it's because we're the ones showing them that. Amen? Did that ever cross anybody's mind? So look, he goes like this. We who are Jews by nature, here's a little sarcasm coming at you, sarcasm alert. We're Jews by nature. In other words, we're God's chosen people, right? We're, uh, we're, we're, we're elevated is what he would be saying to Peter right now. We're, we're Jews with like, a, like a, a sarcastic nod, we're Jews, they're not. 
So we're elevated, so we're already called to a little bit higher, but look what he goes on to say. He goes, we're Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. We're good and we're holy and we're all that. We're not like them. Now that word sinners, we've all heard the word sinners, right? Okay, I'm going to give it to you. All right, check this out. He says, Jews by nature, you know what, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait until I get a little bit further down here before I give it to you. Because there's different words in the Greek that are the same, they're the same word in English, but they're different in Greek, and they really matter. And I'm going to share it with you. So he goes, so, uh, Jews by nature are not sinners of the Gentiles like them, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we may be that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law for by the works of the for by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified and he's saying Peter you know this stuff you know that that we as Christians now not not just Jews we're talking Christian right now man our salvation is by grace through faith our faith in Jesus the grace of God Jesus going to the cross for our sins the law was good, man. I'm, there, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the law. And, and furthermore, for Jews that are, that are orthodox and they follow the law of the letter, hallelujah to them, man. That's their thing, all right? That's what they believe and that's what they want. Far be it from anybody to say, hey, man, you're weird or, you know, don't do that. That would be just as bad as them turning on us and going, look, man, you guys, you guys dress like bikers. Well, duh, you put ink in your arm. You got tattoos. Some of you smoke. You know, I've even heard some of you cuss. <sighs> that legalism would come on, would start pouring down on them. And then you turn back to them and then you go, yeah, but we're having this conversation on Saturday morning. So aren't you supposed to be somewhere doing a, listen to Black Sabbath or something? That's for the uneducated Christians. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you breaking your Sabbath? I mean, isn't that supposed to be something important? Can you see how ugly that can get? Real, real quick. Oh, so Peter, I mean, uh, Paul's telling, telling Peter now, look, we know this. We know this stuff, Peter, that, that we're not justified by our works. You can't give away enough hamburgers to homeless people, all right? You can't vacuum the church floor enough to win salvation. It's not winnable. You can't win salvation. It's impossible to win salvation because it's a free gift from God. And if people are trying to do that, they're wasting their time. In fact, they're wasting precious time. But by faith in Jesus Christ, he goes, look, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Remember, Peter, we all grew up them killing lambs. They killed all these animals as sacrifice. Thing. We know now that's not where it's at, man. That, that was a band-aid. That was something prescribed by God to, to move us through in, in a way that we could feel like our sins had been forgiven, a propitiation of sins, but it's in, we'd be sinning before we left the stinking city, man, because we knew that next year we were just going to do it all over again. That system didn't work out that well. People can be really manipulative. Have you ever encountered manipulative people? Are there any manipulators in here? Anybody ever been a manipulator? I mean, be honest, man. Some, some of us got really good at it, didn't we? Doesn't work out that well now, does it? Check this out. He goes, for by the works of the works, for by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. If that's all we do, if that's all we keep preaching to these guys, you just follow the law, and you're good to go, man. That's a lie. It's not true. It's not straightforward gospel because the gospel message does not say that. The gospel message says, for it, it says that if you believe in your heart and confess in your mouth that Jesus Christ is the Lord, you shall be saved it has nothing to do with keeping the commandments that's all really good though don't don't discount the law or the ten commandments all right they're fantastic great way to live your life by amen if if he's if his oxen is like sitting a little bit close to my house i'm not gonna take it like well he put his hoof over the little borderline right there so it's my oxen now god's real funny about how we follow the Big Ten and the others as well. It's a, like I said, the dietary things, they're really good. Even the laws about, about uncleanliness, like going to places to make you unclean, right now, off the top of your head, can, any, can you guys just think to yourself, not out loud, some real unclean, unclean places you've been that you probably shouldn't be going to or have been to? 
based on the blank faces, I know that you all do. Amen? We've all been to some dark places, haven't we? The question is, are we allowing the flesh to drag us there still? And that's the problem. So check it out. He goes, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? So the word sinners here that they were referring to these Gentiles as, the word over here is amarto. It is, it's eartolos, 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 eartolos. It's the word sinner, but this is what it means. Devoted to sin and heathens. Not just missing the mark, which we're going to get to, but devoted to sin. I mean, you look at somebody, and we've all, we all know people that are just running around, running amok out there and things like that. They just have no desire of godliness in their life at all. They just move from one thing to another thing, or they're stuck in the same old stupid sin. That's what that word is right there. And he goes, look, so, but, if we, but, if, but if while we seek to, to, to be justified by Christ, we're, we're also found as sinners. We're also found as habitual sinners. No intention to stop. That's the problem. Oh, but I've quit doing drugs. I quit running from cops, especially after I got that stinking helicopter. That made it hard. So this little thing that I'm doing over here, it's natural. He understands. He does understand 100% that this is what you are. You're habitual. You haven't given everything to God yet, man. And you're like, well, why does my life suck? You know, I go to church all the time. I tithe. I do this and I do that. It's like it has nothing to do with any of that, man. It has to do with this one thing or maybe a couple of things who knows what's going on in your life but this is what paul's trying to get through to peter right here that these guys they might look different they might have different ways that they they live their life but they're all under the same gospel man they're not heathens yes they were at one point they were savages who wasn't in this room at some point or another far from God. I mean, there might be a couple of you here that, that maybe grew up in the church, but, but don't tell me you didn't think of doing horrible things to your siblings from one time or another. Amen. I never was murderous or anything, but I did pop Ken's head off and pop Barbie's head off, and I put Ken on Barbie and Barbie on Ken. I don't even know. How, well, today I'd probably be like, yeah, nice. I don't know. <laughs> oh, I got that one. I'm sorry. I'm back. Moving on. But look at the next word. Remember sinners right there. That the, the, the devoted to sin. The habitual non-stopping. Or no intention of stopping or even trying to stop. I mean, sometimes you can get into habitual sin and it, it, it gets so bad that you're, you're trapped in it. You can't get out. And, and it's kind of like a, like a mudslide that just keeps picking up and, and you're trapped within that stuff. And and prayfully someone confronts you, and you can just pew, jump right out. And then there's others, though, that, that choose to just stay in that same place over and over. It might be different places, different thing, different people, but it's still the same habitual sin that they just won't let go of. So the flesh is strong, man. And he says, so if, if we're found to be that, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Because we're following everything that he's telling us to do. So if we're going to continue to be this, then that must mean he's that. And, and that word sin is this, hamartia. Hamartia in the Greek. And this is what it means, to miss the mark or to error. Now that's the sin that we all think about, right? When we sin and fall short of the glory of God, the whole thing is like the bow and arrow. Pew! And they'd shoot it through rings and they'd miss it. And like, sinner! Because you missed the mark. It's like going down the freeway and someone's honking at you and you flip them that Norwegian sign language. You miss the mark, man. You, you sinned. But that's not what the first one was. So what Paul's describing to Peter, he's going, so basically, he's the guy that calls the shots on all this stuff. He says, it's a, you missed the mark. Un understand what I'm saying here. If these people are doing some heinous stuff under that word sinners right there. This is what Paul's explaining to Peter, to Peter now. Doing things that, with, with people, with places, with animals, stealing, whatever, just, just horrible stuff, then he's saying that Christ now is, the Christ that we're serving is now willing to 
minimize that to uh, missing the mark. Yeah, maybe it was murder. Maybe it was adultery. Maybe they were ripping off the church or something like that, which at some point you get stoned for, hung or something like that. And he's going, well, if, what you're, if the way you're acting right now, it makes it like we can do pretty much whatever we want, knowing that Jesus is just going to call it a little sin, just missing the mark. But the, the truth of that is, and the truth of the gospel is, there's no such thing as a little sin. A little sin is just as convicting as a big sin in, in God's eyes. We need, we, we, we've been forgiven of all sins, all of them. Isn't that great that he doesn't have a list? Like, you know, from bottom to the top. Wouldn't it suck if, you know, you're, you're doing good all the way up to here, and then all of a sudden, like, 20 more sins above, like the red line where you're not allowed to cross this, and you got four or five of them up there? Wouldn't that be a drag? What if we just try to work harder at it? And the easiest way to avoid it in my own personal life, I'll tell you how I, it, it's easier for me, is to be serving God. It, it's, it's not like it's impossible, you know, to, and I'm not saying I'm sinless at all, but when I'm out ministering or when I'm like doing even the rolling glory for thing, that we're, we're in the, we're working in what something that God has called us to do. It's a lot easier to walk right with God than it is when you're all by yourself. Anybody ever get in trouble when they're all by yourself? Nobody? You guys? Okay. Yeah, but you you always sin, dude. You're, I mean, just so you know, you're the only one that ever raises his hands in this church. <laughs> okay, that's cool. I'm, and I appreciate it. I appreciate it, man. No, you're not the only one, buddy. There's others. Um, there's just different styles. They're like, like that. Or every now and then they'll raise their hand, they look around, they'll go, ah. Yeah. <laughs> Paul is for for this to happen to Peter, who was with Jesus, and he sinned. You know, he made a lot of mistakes. Peter did, but he he was a good man, and he and he is a good man. And for Paul to be jamming him up like this, this would have been like a a yod to the heart, man. Like, dude, you're just you're just like you're killing me here, man. But it was important because Peter was going to go on to lead that church. Peter would go on to be the leader of, of that church in that whole region there and raise up hundreds and thousands of great leaders that would go all over the world and do stuff. It had to be stopped here, man. If it didn't get stopped right here, it would have infected Peter even more and then infected more people as well and damaged the church, maybe irreparably, in that, in, in that area. So even though it sucks to have to be the one to do that, if God puts it on your heart, man up or woman up, pray up, know your verses in the Bible so you don't come at them legalistically either. Galatians 6 is a great place to look if you're having to deal with anything like that right now. You can go there, get a lot of great advice from the Word. So he goes on here like this. Certainly not. That is not what our Jesus is. He's not a sin pimp. He's Jesus Christ, Almighty God, Savior, Messiah. We're the ones that screw things up. So he goes like this, Certainly not, for if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. What is he talking about there, man? I'll show you what he's talking about. Have you guys been delivered from horrible stuff in your life? Things that you look back on now and maybe you're ashamed of. Maybe you feel guilty of. And I, I caution you against that. Amen. You walk that walk, that's your life, and that's your testimony that you've been delivered from. And there's a whole world of people out there that are going through the same thing that everyone in this room already went through. The only thing that's different between us and them is that we have victory and they don't, which means we can take all of our experience and go, look, this is who I was, this is what I did, and I know it's heinous, it's a horrible story, but I met Jesus, man, and he washed me clean in his word. By the blood of Christ, I was forgiven, and I am now a man or a woman of God. And I'm here to tell you right now, you don't have to live another day like that, man. I know a way out because we remember what it was like to be up against the wall, man, and there was no escape anywhere. There was no way out. And then Jesus popped in, man, and plucked us out of that muck and mire. And here we are today, amen, still alive. We have so much to offer. Anyway, he said, for though, for, 
for if I build again those things that I destroyed, I make myself out to be a transgressor. And a transgressor is, is a breaker of the law, just so we understand. Sin missing the mark is one thing. A transgressor is about planning stuff. Planning. Ah, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. You know, ooh, keep it quiet, though. Don't let anybody know. Sometimes things happen on the fly, and it's a sin. And sometimes we plan. And that, that is a whole nother level right there. Because now it, it, it doesn't imply it's absolute that we are now moving the word of God to the side. And we're like, okay, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, and we're going to do this. It's not cool. It's not godly. It doesn't please him at all. But it does please my flesh. So we're going to plan this thing out right here. No one's going to know. Don't worry about it. Let's keep it under our hat. You know the whole conversation is being listened to by God, right? And does anybody think that God can't move hearts and hands in a direction that he wants them to go? It, does anybody really think secrets are that easily kept in here still? Anybody? Okay, good. Glad to see that. Because they're not. Especially if God loves you. If you're one of his kids, he will make ways through stuff and out of stuff. If you're just willing to be wise and and follow those paths. But if you're just going to be stupid and stubborn, at some point, the hammer's going to come down, man. Because he loves you. I know that sounds weird and backwards and stuff like that, but you got to look at it from God's perspective. He already knows your future. He already knows the plans that he laid out for you. Plans of hope and a future and progress and prosperity, all kinds of things. And imagine if you had to be God and deal with us. It's like, where are you going now, Crusher? Dude, you're like so close right now to that. You're like, ooh, over here. You throw an apple and hit a boom. I'm like, oh, where'd that come from? I don't know, but I'm still looking at my shiny thing. <laughs> Eventually, someone has to come over and oppose him. And, it, and it's, not a, it's not a pleasant thing to be the opposer. Not pleasant to be opposed, as a matter of fact. But God will get your attention one way or another. And I'm gonna, I want to share something with you guys. Be joyful and blessed that God will do that for you and not let you just keep going down that stinking hole. Amen? Any further. He really loves you. So check this out. For though the law, for, for I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. This is crazy coming from Paul, man, because he was a lawyer of lawyers, a Pharisee of Pharisees, and he understood that the law, as good as it is, was kind of a dead-end street. You only get so far with the law in terms of salvation, glorification, justification, because they're going to kill something for you. They're going to kill an animal. They're going to be a sacrifice. And you're going to be proclaimed clean or sinless at this point. And then it all starts over again. And Paul knew that in his head, that it was, it was, still, it was like a revolving door. And you come back around to it, come back around to it. And it wasn't meant to be that way. It wasn't meant for us to go to the, to the temple and sacrifice animals and then leave there all fresh and clean, knowing that next year we'll just do it again. We'll, we'll party like rock stars because there's going to be another lamb we're going to kill. That wasn't God's intention. God's intention was that we're human and we're fleshy and we're going to make mistakes. And he provided a way for us to be forgiven so that then we could learn from it and go on and live that whole year without sinning. Not intentionally going, hey, well, now we've got a whole 365-day pass to go do whatever we want. Humanity sucks in this stuff, man. God gives us beautiful things to live by, and then we manipulate it into something else. I know that there was a lot of people throughout all the centuries that saw that for what it was, made a mistake, and, it, and, it, and they were guilt-ridden by that, man. And they prayed, and they talked to God about it. And the Day of Atonement would come, and boom, that, that, was, that burden was lifted off them. And then they went on with their lives and lived great, productive lives and raised kids and puppies and kittens and all kinds of cool stuff like that in the, in the knowledge that they'd been forgiven of that thing. It doesn't mean they won't sin again, you know, but they, no, I'm talking about the sin of, of, of inaction or inactivity where they didn't mean to. Something happens, they get mad, they cuss, they do something, whatever. But the transgression and all that stuff, like David and Bathsheba, that was, that was transgression. The sin happened when he peeked over the side, you know. He, well, probably before that, he should have been out fighting with his guys in the battle, as a matter of fact. But when he went outside and he peeked over and he's like, boy, vey, 
wow, there's Bathsheba down there doing her sunbathing or something like that. Right then and there, that's where David says, Lord, forgive me, la, 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 pluck my eyes out, put coals to my eyeballs, Father, and off you, off you go. But he didn't. You know what he did? He took a second look. How many of us have fallen for that old trick of the devil? You see something of the flesh, you're like, whoa. Yeah, well, anyway, and then, you know, you're like, oh, man, 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 man. <laughs> That's it. The hook's set. Boom. Right then and there. You're done. Welcome to humanity, man. We can see something. And you can lust over something, man. You know, and, it, and it, it's a sin. I get it. You know, you spot that thing. But listen, you can walk away from that right then and there, man. You can walk away. He'll always provide a way out, man. And we got to learn and train ourselves up, man. You know what? That's a really nice looking truck right there, man. You know what? I could pop that ignition in like seconds. But I'm not. Pew, and off we go, right? And we're gone. But if you take a second look, more than likely you're going to find your butt under there, aren't you? Clumping wires and all that other stuff. And every other thing that you can imagine, I'm sure you do, all right, that we get ourselves into. Just think of this for a second. It's the second look that hooks you. It's just, a, it's just a practice, man. I'm trying to put them into practice in my own life, man. The second look hooks you. Maybe it's just me. Maybe it's my own personal experiences in my life and stuff like that. But I'm learning, man. I'm learning to move on, get gone, and you get on with whatever the heck else you're doing in life without letting the hook be set. It doesn't mean the enemy's not going to come back around, because he will. But you know what? We don't have to give the, vi the enemy victory in our lives. We give Jesus the victory in our lives. Amen? So check out what he says here. I have been, he says, uh, for, for through the law, for though the law died, died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm living my life in the footsteps of Christ. You know the old bumper sticker, what would Jesus do? The thing has been around? I got one. Would Jesus take a second look? Do <laughs> you think we can make a bumper sticker out of that? Would, would Jesus? That's kind of long. All right. How would, how would Jesus handle that situation? I know that's kind of back to the what would Jesus do thing, right? But Paul's saying here, look, man, I'm not tripping on the laws. Because I can get hung up on that knowing that I can circumvent it and maybe even manipulate it. He goes, no, man, look, as a matter of fact, I'm dead. I died with Christ on the cross. I have devoted my entire life to Christ. And the life which I live now that's in this flesh still, he goes, I live in faith in the Son of God. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He's putting all of his priorities correctly in his life. That Jesus died, he puts the cross in front of him. Jesus died for me so that I don't have to go down this ugly road. As pleasurable as it might be for a moment, sin's only fun for a season. There's always a consequence. There's always a payment to be made, you guys. No one gets out alive in this stuff. Yet, walking behind that cross throughout our life is going to be difficult because we're going to encounter all kinds of stuff out there, but we will be prepared, prayed up, and armored up to do whatever God has called us to do. And the things that you might want to see, that you might look at now and take a second look at, then you'll, you'll see the same things, but you won't see them the same way. You're not going to be looking at them from a fleshly way. You're going to be looking at them from a spiritual way through the lenses of Christ. And now what might have been something like, ooh, got to have that, is going to be something like, man, I need to pray. I need, to pray. I need to make a phone call. I need to get somebody down here, man, to, that can talk to that person or someone down here that can help with that dog. There's one right back there, as a matter of fact. Whatever it is, right? Now we're thinking through the lens of Christ now, not through the lens of our flesh. It's doable. It's possible, you guys. It really is, because these guys all went on to do it. Okay, so here's how he wraps it up tonight. Uh, live in flesh and faith. Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. And, and that word aside right there is actually translated um, frustrate. I do not frustrate the grace of God. And, and it's so cool because do we, do we often frustrate the grace of God with the freedom we've been given in Christ? We're not, we're not, we're not, 
what we were before. Amen. We've been delivered from much. We've been given much. We've been blessed with much. And then we go do stupid stuff. That's the frustration of Christ. If I mean frustration of grace. If I was God, man, and I and I sacrificed my only son in the, the most heinous way that a person could die, and then you, us, just flippantly, you know, like, oh yeah, praise the Lord, I'm saved by grace. Ooh, shiny thing. Man, I would I would hit like the smite have a smite button, like big one on a heavenly console. Smite, smite. You know, and I'd get creative. It wouldn't just be like lightning bolts. I'd use those too. I would do like hippopotamuses, you know, cool steamrollers to flatten roads and stuff. Oh, my smiting would be bad. H hence why I'm not God. Amen? Yeah. I'm not God. I'm not Jesus. I'm not the Holy Spirit. I'm lucky to be here right now, man, to be totally honest with you. But he's like, look, he goes, I don't set, I don't try to frustrate God. I, I try to please my God. I want God to be pleased with my life. I want him to be pleased with my actions. I want him to be pleased with my worship, man. That's what Paul's saying here. I don't want him to be frustrated and go, ah, what is he doing now? Why does he keep doing this? Why does she keep going down that same road? She doesn't have, does she not have any more self-esteem for herself than that? Come on, man. You guys have been set free from this sin. We have all been set free. And you know when the sun sets you free? You are. Free free. Amen. So why, why, would, why would we even want to frustrate the grace of God? Man, we, we should truly, honestly, and I'm not just trying to like be preachy here. We ought to be celebrating every moment that we're alive, the grace of God in our lives. Because ask yourself this. If not for Jesus at the moment in your life, where would you be today? If it wasn't for that moment that God's grace poured over you, wherever you were, whatever you were doing, imagine where you would be today. Or would you even be? Would you even still be around? Would you exist? Probably not for some of us in this room. Amen. So he goes like this. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. And, and that word, that word's pretty hardcore, man. It's, it's uh, Dorian, and the Greek is what, is what it is, and it means for nothing. That's just basically what it means, for nothing. If righteousness comes through the law that we can circumvent, then Christ died for nothing. And let me tell you something. Christ did not die for nothing. Amen. He died for every person in this room right now. He died for every person in this world, man. He did not die in vain. And we can't ever let the enemy try to trick us into believing that stuff right there. Because he would like to. He, he would like to tell you, you know what? Jesus blew it. Put a dope. I can't believe he fell for that. I, I'm going to tell you right now, man. The enemy's got some bad moon risings coming at him, man. He's, he's the father of lies. You can't believe anything that comes from any of that right there. And there's a lot of demonic stuff going on in our nation right now. Just something to keep an eye on and keep praying for. But know this, Jesus loves you. He loved you right to the cross, and he's going to love you right through eternity. Amen? Let's try not to frustrate the grace. Look at your get it questions. How can you confront someone close face to face if you got something going on? Pray hard, man. Get some time in prayer. And if it's really hardcore, get some fasting time. You know, skip a meal. Or a day or something like that. And ask God to reveal things to you. Be in your word, man. Seek some stuff out there. And then go in love. Not hatred. You can't go out and, you know, swinging both fists and stuff like that. Galatians 1 says, those that are spiritual, if a brother's caught in sin, those that are spiritual, restore him gently. Amen? And you want to, and, the, and the whole purpose is to go, aha, I got you, steamboat. I knew it. You and those cats. It's not to drive Steamboat away. It's to help Steamboat to draw him out of that mess that he's in. The feeling of being trapped and nowhere to go, man. And just freaking out, paranoid all the time, head on a swivel and stuff. What a, what a fun way to live a life, right? It's not fun. I know. And so we pull him out gently, get him over here away from that, and then we talk and we confront and prayfully. He just, he finally gets past all the humanity of 
wine and excuses and all the other bowl that we do and then just say you know man yeah i yeah i'm guilty i confess man and then the forgiveness begins and then the restoration begins and the re revival begins and all the stuff that god's got and it all hinges on repentance i know that's an old-fashioned word but it means to never look back i know everyone's like oh we turn away we do 180 and that's true but repentance is a genuine emotion from our heart that says, I will never, I have no desire, there's no way in heaven. I'm going back there again, man, ever. And whoop, off you go. And i got to tell you the truth, God knows the difference, too. Do you have something in your life that needs confronting? Shoot your hand up and we'll take care of it right now. Funny story. I know some of you that do. I know more than you guys can imagine. But anyway, that's another Bible study. Check this out. It takes lots of guts and a ton of love to step up, but it's worth it. Trust me. Be careful not to fall into judgment or to take hold of Dad's glory in the victory. All the glory goes to God all the time. Amen? It's a great rule to live by, you guys. Never try to snatch God's glory. All glory goes to God for everything. That whole rolling glory run, that's why we call it that. It's rolling God glory, man, all the way across the country. We don't, man, we're, we don't own it here at the Roadhouse. It just happens to start here. Every state goes through there, and God will be glorified state by state. And I believe this time, because of what it is, because we're standing with Israel, that God's going to be even more glorified throughout our country. I know sometimes we focus on the protesting and all the ugliness, but let me tell you, man, all, my phone's blowing up right now, as a matter of fact. All day long, I've been getting calls from all over the country, people desperately wanting to carry those flags. American patriots, America, the spirit of America is alive and well, and we're just not having all that stupid stuff, man. It's ugly, it's divisive, it's not okay, man, and it doesn't represent who we are with these flags right here as a nation. And so these people, the, the Jewish nation um, in Israel, the Jews here in America that are feeling like all of a sudden they have to hide their little stars of David so no one will see them and stuff like that. I'm like, hell no. Get yourself a big old T-shirt with a big old star of David. We'll walk you to class and see how them little wing nuts act. Not that I'm promoting violence because I'm not. Okay? I'm just saying we'll be happy and joyful as we walk and, you know, do and every now and then just for fun <laughs> little growls every now and then doesn't hurt amen yeah we're, we're probably not allowed on campus by the way just so you know so don't go trying to do that hector i see you, the wheels spinning in your head right now <laughs> don't all right well my pastor said Ugh. okay we're in, we're in some perilous times right now, but we're in some exciting times right now. It's all a perspective and how you look at it, man. If we're going to focus on the ugliness on the news, you're going to be bummed out, man. But you know what? If we focus on the victories that are coming, all we need to do is ask God, Lord, what can I do to continue being in victory with you and winning battle after battle after battle after battle that I can continuously just can glorify you and give all the glory to you. Lord, here I am. Send me. Where do you want me to be? Amen. And all the junk that's, that's starting to stick to some people, don't fall for that, man. That's the enemy trying to hold you down because you are mightier than you can ever imagine by the blood of Christ. Amen. Father, we thank you tonight for your word, Lord. And, and uh, yeah, sometimes adjustments need to be made. Things need to happen, Father. But we thank you that you're, you're a gracious God, Father. And your word says that you correct those that you love. And so, Father, we thank you for that, that you just... You don't let us get too far away, man, that you're always there for us. So tonight, our desire is that those that don't even know you, your son as Savior tonight, Lord, that they can, they can come to him tonight and start this relationship with him. And, and it, is, it is challenging. It is difficult sometimes. But it is so fulfilling and so rewarding, Lord. And we thank you for that. So as we pray together as a family, we invite your Holy Spirit to move through this room and have his way. Move through that camera out there as well, Lord. So tonight, Father, I ask for victory in this church and lives. In Jesus' name, let's pray. Father God, I sin against you, Lord. And I ask you to forgive me my sin. And Jesus, I invite you into my heart to be the Lord and Savior of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and put me on that road 
you'll have me travel. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. amen. That, was, that was cool. Okay, we're going to have girls praying here, guys praying over here. Come and get some prayer. Don't be a square. And I will see you all on Saturday, amen? Keep your eyes on Jesus. God bless you. Amen.